this morning. You know, there's a scene in the book of Revelation with an innumerable host gathered around the throne of God, praising Him and declaring His worth. Have you seen yourself there? I've seen myself there. I'm looking forward to that day when we will know face to face and not through the glass darkly. We'll be able to praise him right before his throne. We do that in spirit today, but there is coming a day when we will be gathered to him. And um, in the church, when he's gathered with us, is... um, in the spirit, the same type of idea. It's why we bow our heads when we pray. Why do you bow your head when you pray? In the presence of the king. He's here with us. We bow before his throne and uh, and acknowledge the truth uh, of who he is. I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Galatians, chapter number 3. We'll stand and read a few verses from the book of Galatians. There's only one way you can know. You know, a lot of people hope to be there. I talk to a lot of people that hope to be there. And it is our expectation to be there, but we ought to be able to know if we'll be there. The Bible says that there's things written that we can know that we are saved, that we are in Christ, that we can have confidence when we stand before him. So what is it that a man needs to stand before a perfectly holy, perfectly just, and righteous God with confidence? I mean, it's it's not as easy as it sounds. The only reason it feels like it's easy in the flesh is because of the pride of the flesh. But to stand in his presence and have any confidence is not as easy as it sounds. However, the scripture gives us exactly what we need. And I want you to follow me this morning as we look at some of those things from Scripture. We're going to read in the book of Galatians chapter number 3. We're going to read in verse number 6 and following, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Heavenly Father, this morning as we gather together unto your word, we really pray and desire that your spirit might speak to our hearts to reveal to us the truths of your word and your scripture that we can't discover by any natural means They're not revealed by flesh and blood, but, Lord, by your Spirit. We pray this morning that your Spirit would speak to our hearts, not for our sake, Lord, or to our credit, certainly not. We know and understand that we've brought nothing of worth or value into your presence as we've gathered here this morning. But we plead only the blood of Christ and pray that for the sake of the blood of Christ, which he shed for us, that you might do these things. And for the sake of the name of Christ, the name unto whom we are gathered this morning. And Father, it's out of respect for his name and his blood and his work that we ask that you work among us this morning by your spirit to bring forth in our hearts and in our minds an understanding that we need to know you, to know Christ, and to have the confidence that we seek that when we stand before your throne in the day of judgment that we might not be ashamed. Father, we pray that you might work this in our hearts this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. All right, you may be seated. We have in the book of Galatians, Paul using some examples from the Old Testament to help us in our thinking and in our understanding as Christians, as those who are of faith in Christ, that we can understand from some things that were given in the scriptures from the Old Testament that help us in our walk with Christ as we have come to him in faith. Obviously, there was a lot of things going on in the church at Galatia, and there was a lot of teaching that had come into the church 
that didn't promote faith in Christ, it promoted the works of men. And because of this doctrine that had come into the church, Paul set forth to write this letter that the church at Galatia might be perfectly founded in faith in Christ alone. And so he's going to set some things in order for us. And to this end, he begins talking about the children of Abraham. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. How many of you know the song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you. Well, turns out, as Paul's going on to teach and to explain, not all of the sons of Abraham were the sons of promise. Not all the sons of Abraham were recipients and heirs with Abraham of the blessing. Abraham had other sons that were of his own work. They were of bondage. They were of slavery. They were of the works of the flesh. And these sons are not the heirs of promise. So Paul's setting some things in order for us that we can understand to be the promised seed in Christ is what we are looking for because it's that seed that was promised the inheritance and the blessing of God. So let's look at this if we could. In verse number six, we know from our study a few weeks back that the word of the Lord came to Abraham and Abraham believed God. So he believed God and that faith that he had that God would perform his promise was accounted to him for righteousness. He says in verse number seven, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, came, of, and he was the promised seed. Those who have been joined to Christ by faith are in Christ and are of the seed of Abraham. It says in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the what? Gospel. Now that word is not just thrown in there. For no reason. Because Paul is leading up to chapter number 4 where he's going to set forth basically the two covenants. The covenant of promise and the covenant that was at Mount Sinai, which tends to bondage. And that's exactly what I want to guide your thinking into this morning. That these covenants, the covenant of promise that was made to Abraham was called the gospel. You will not find in scripture that the covenant at Mount Sinai is anywhere referred to as the gospel. It brought no gospel with it. It was a covenant that supposed for man to enjoy God's blessing that he must obey his law. That's what the covenant at Mount Sinai confirmed. And the people in their pride declared, every word that God hath spoken, we will do. Yeah. And God himself in the scriptures declared that the man who does those things shall live in them. And that's what I call in the scriptures, it's a snare set for those who walk in pride. Because they read that and say, see, the scripture says, if I walk in those commandments and keep them, then I will live. So this is exactly what it says, isn't it? It says exactly that. And for those who walk in pride, they think, I'm going to do that. I'm going to keep those commandments. I'll live according to those things, and I will become a partaker of the covenant, blinded by their pride, not realizing it's impossible to continue in all things that are written. And the Bible says if you don't continue... In all things that are written, then the law, which is good, is a curse to you. It's a curse to you. It doesn't bring a blessing. And it's never declared to men to be the gospel. But Abraham had received the gospel, which was what? It was the word of God given to Abraham according to promise. So what Paul's about to do is to embark on an argument that lays forth these covenants. One given to Abraham according to promise. 
and the other that came after that was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, which was of works. Both necessary. Both absolutely necessary for the work of God and for the word of God to be effectual in us. You have to have both. You must have both. But you'll notice that Paul's argument in chapter number four turns to looking at each of these covenants as mothers. And that each of them bears children to Abraham. One bears children to Abraham only after the flesh, and it tends to bondage. The other bears children to Abraham of promise and of faith, and that tends to freedom and to life and to the inheritance. So let's unpack this a little bit if we can. I want to take this whole idea of being the children of Abraham and knowing and understanding that the scripture has set forth and declared for us that there are uh, more children of Abraham than those who are the heirs of the blessing of promise. We're going to find that back in Genesis chapter number 16. And I hope for this not to be uh, tough sledding this morning, as it were. But I think if you, if you follow through with this, you'll see uh, that it is, in fact, essential to our understanding of the gospel and the confidence that we seek to have when we stand before Christ that we will, in fact, be received or have been received already if we've come to him in faith. In chapter number 16... Let's just read this story real quick. It says, Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. So in other words, what happened? Abram and Sarah had already received the promise. And they were living in expectation. While they were living in expectation... They decided, hey, I bet we can fix this. I mean, we can, we can work this out so that God can fulfill his promise. What are they trying to do? They're trying to put some amount of human effort and human works into what God had promised to say that when the promise comes to pass, they will be able to look back and say, it's a good thing that we did that, because our doing that allowed God to fulfill his promise. This is kind of what's in view in the scriptures. And by the way, none of this is happenstance. These things are ordained and written for our examples. So God, in his sovereignty, in his wisdom, which is past finding out, works through the life of Abraham to preserve a story for us that shows us a type of things we will need to know and consider and see to understand the gospel. And so here's this story playing out, and they're going to say, well, we had this son, and now God can fulfill his promise because we did something. Because we took an act or a measure, we used our understanding and our resourcefulness to figure it out so that God's promise could be kept. God's promise in Scripture is always ordained in such a way that it entirely excludes any boasting. In other words, when, when Ishmael was born and, and came into the world, Abraham desired for him to be the heir. God rejected him as the heir. Do you understand that? God rejected Abraham's works and said, absolutely not. Ishmael will not be the heir, because he's a product of your effort, and your understanding, and your thinking, and it's going to be accomplished in such a way that you will be not able to boast in anything but the glory of God. 
So God is interested in performing his promise, but he'll do it in a way that entirely excludes boasting. We know that from the New Testament, don't we? Where is boasting then? It's excluded. God in his wisdom and in his sovereignty has excluded boasting because it's wrong for us to boast in our own strength and wisdom and might and power. And many, many people professing belief in scripture are just like Abraham and they bring their Ishmael to God and say, how about Ishmael? I, I just pray that you'll accept Ishmael. And God said, I refuse him. I won't accept Ishmael. Because he's your own works. He's your own effort. And I'll not accept it. It's not acceptable in lieu of the promise. And so this, this whole idea of Ishmael and his birth and how all these things relate to us and our understanding of the gospel are absolutely imperative. So they, they figure this out. Hagar does conceive according to the flesh and the natural order of things. And when she did conceive, what happened then? Her mistress was despised in her eyes. Another type of the flesh. Another type of the flesh. And guess what? Ishmael came to be whenever Isaac was born. He was the son of his mother. And he despised Isaac. Just like, it, just like Hagar despised Sarah. Why is that? Because the flesh despises the spirit. It's at war and enmity with the spirit. And so we see in Abram what we see in ourselves. That he had a fleshly nature to contend with. And he had the righteousness of God imputed to him by faith. Through which God by his own power kept his promise and preserved the seed and those who would become the heirs of the blessing. So all this is working out uh, and being recorded in scripture by the Holy Spirit of God so that we could learn and understand these things. So Sarah says unto Abraham, my wrong be upon thee. And guess what? It is. Men, when you listen to your wife and then it doesn't work out and then she comes back to you and says, hey, that's your fault. She's actually correct. It's your fault. That's, that's the privilege of being the husband, of being the head of the home. That yes, you get to be responsible even when you listen to her and it's wrong. And so Sarah realizes that and says, hey, that's your problem. And, and it, did, it was a source of grief for Abraham. It was a source of sorrow for Abraham uh, because he had done this thing. And it was a, a, a constant source of difficulty in the family. He says, I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. And Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah had dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. So what happens? Abraham says, Sarah, it's your maid. You do what you would like to do with her. And so Sarah deals hardly with her. And guess how much of that the flesh is going to take? The flesh isn't having any of that. The flesh isn't going to take that, right? So what does she do? She says, I'm out of here. I'm going to go do something else. And she runs off. But interestingly, the Lord intervenes. The Lord intervenes here. And he said, Hagar, next two words, Sarah is made, right? By the way, just, just running away doesn't make it not so, right? So she was Herai's maid. So this is the whole idea of the flesh and the spirit. That the flesh has its place, but it is to be subjugated by the spirit, not the other way around. So the flesh is, is useful, right? It's a vehicle that God has given us this tabernacle and he has indwelt it with our soul and our spirit, and it allows us to have relationship with one another. It allows us to enjoy his creation. But what does the flesh do? It wants to lead. It wants to be out in front. It wants to do what it wants. And that's, that's contrary to how it is to be lived out in truth. So the Lord says, Sarah is made. Whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. Sarah. 
And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name, what? Ishmael. Now, this is fascinating, because Ishmael was named by God. And God put his name in on Ishmael, just like he did with Israel. Israel and Ishmael. And these things are set forth in Scripture to show us the sovereignty and the providence of God in both the flesh and the spirit. But Ishmael means God will hear. God will hear. And, and if we look at the life of Ishmael and how it plays out in Scripture, we see a lot of fascinating things about the fact that, uh, that here's this woman who came out of Egypt, right, was joined, as, as Paul goes on to explain, in a type of covenant relationship with Abraham according to the flesh, which is what the law at Sinai was. And being joined of the flesh, brought out of Egypt, brings forth a son, and that son is of the bondwoman. She's of the woman that came out of Egypt, according to the flesh, brought forth of the flesh, and it we'll see all the wonderful traits that Ishmael had. However, God named the son, and he put his name on it. And if you follow the story on out, you'll see that he bears 12 princes, 12 tribes. So there's a lot going on in this passage that I think is instructive for us. By the time we get back to Galatians, we kind of need to be familiar with this story. But notice what the angel says unto her. He says, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, or God will hear, because the Lord hath what? Heard thy affliction. So God will hear. He heard Hagar's cry. Later in Ishmael's life, the son that's actually brought forth from this relationship, after he's named Ishmael, he's out in the wilderness after being thrown out of the home of his father, and they're out in the wilderness again, and God hears his cry. So the name Ishmael reminds us that God will hear. But the, the son Ishmael shows us all those sons of Abraham that are born not according to promise and the spirit of freedom from the mother which is uh, tending to freedom and life, but are brought forth according to the flesh only. And these things are set forth. Paul goes on to say this is an allegory for us. The reason this is important uh, I will go on to explain further, but there's a lot of people. This whole idea of, of two sons. You know, the Lord even told a parable, didn't he? A certain man had two sons. And he goes on to, to use this idea of these two sons to talk about the things that are of Christ. Here we have this, this story of two sons set forth. Both are of Abraham, both in their own minds have a claim to the blessing as the descendants of Abraham, which, by the way, is still the fight going on today. It's still the fight in the Middle East over which son should have gotten the blessing, which son should have been the son that got the inheritance and the blessing. And the Arabs are still fighting over this same thing. Well, listen, this is a spiritual allegory as well. So while we can look to the earth and we see... That in fact, exactly what the angel speaks of here in verse number 12, it says, He will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me, for she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? And we see then, down further on in verse number 15, that Hagar did in fact bear this son. That Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare what? Ishmael, according to the word of the Lord, who had told him. And so God puts his name on Ishmael, just like he put his name on Israel. Ishmael, if we go back to Galatians, we, get, we can study the life of Ishmael and, and glean some interesting things. 
And while you're turning back to the book of Galatians, while we get in a little further into what Paul was trying to teach, I want you to think about Ishmael. Later on, when Isaac is born and then weaned, we know that Ishmael taunted Isaac. Right? He teased him, uh, and he didn't have a lot of use for Isaac. What does that mean? Well, it means that Ishmael is of a spirit that has no regard for the promise of God or the providence of God or the promise of God. He wants the blessing of God only. So we have in view a man that's seeking the blessing of God on his terms. He's interested in the things of God. He's interested in what the Bible says. He's seeking after all of those things that God promises to him as a son, but refuses to acknowledge the promise, refuses to acknowledge the providence of God in choosing Isaac. Look at Jonathan as a great contrast in Scripture of a man who was of a different spirit, that he saw that God had called David to be king. Jonathan, according to the flesh, had a claim to the throne of Israel, but he loved David. And he loved the God that chose David. And he had respect to the word of God that was revealed through the prophet Samuel that God had chosen David. So what did Jonathan decide to do? He decided to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh and to serve the king that God had chosen. That is a tremendous contrast to what we see in the life of Ishmael. Ishmael was of the flesh. What does that mean? Well, he's older. He's bigger. He's stronger, right? He's self-directed. He's self-centered. He's used to being the only one. He's experienced. He's independent. All the things that our flesh is when we come to Christ. All the things that our flesh is. So Ishmael is that type of the flesh. And then Isaac comes along 14 years later. So who's got the advantage? Ishmael. He's got a leg up. I mean, there's not a lot of 14-year-olds that can't pretty well take any two-year-old they decide they want to contend with. Right? He's a babe. But what what does it tell us of the spirit of the matter? It tells us that the spirit, when we are born of the spirit, there's a process of maturity that's taking place. But the flesh has already got a leg up. In this case, the type we have in the allegory is 14 years of advantage. That he's he's gotten a head start, and so he's already very strong. But the qualities of the spirit of Ishmael are manifest in Scripture. And so we see, conversely, that Isaac, who's a type of the child of promise, born of the spirit, is younger, smaller, weaker. He's not as... He's not as experienced. He's quite inexperienced. He's not as independent. He's quite dependent. We see Isaac following his father up to Mount Moriah, willingly subjugated to the will of his father for his life. And we see a completely different spirit in the heart of Isaac than we see in Ishmael. Ishmael was striving with all men. Isaac went and dug wells that were rightfully his. And when people fought him for the wells, he removed to another place and dug another well. And when people fought him for that well, he removed to another place and dug another well. We see, we see Isaac and Ishmael really set in complete contrast with the spirit of the man and how they lived their lives. And those things are to be an allegory for us. That surprise, surprise, just like Ishmael didn't care for Isaac, your flesh has no use for the things of the Spirit. Doesn't like the Spirit. Your flesh says, I know what's best for me. The providence of God doesn't even enter the equation. You live out your life just seeking the desires of your own heart, like Ishmael did. He wanted the blessing. He saw Isaac as an obstacle Isaac was a fulfillment of God's promise. Ishmael didn't care. He's an obstacle to me because he's in the way of me getting what I want. And these things live themselves out in our own life as well. So we see in Abraham both the things of the flesh and the things of the spirit. 
We realize uh, that this same struggle is going on in us, which in actually Galatians 4.29 becomes part of Paul's teaching when he says, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. And this is true on several levels. So I want to get into Galatians chapter number 4, because this is really the thrust of what we're looking at this morning. While we could spend a lot of time just looking at Ishmael and Isaac and the contrast between these two sons, how they came on on the scene, the differences between their mothers, the differences between their own character and, and their own personalities, and how those things manifested themselves throughout their lives, Uh, We're going to jump forward a little bit to the book of Galatians to look at the allegorical aspect of these things. So let's let's just jump there. I'm I'm going to skip part of my notes for time's sake, and we'll we'll jump over to Galatians chapter number four. Now you can begin reading through in verse 29 of chapter three. He's talking about if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we're getting into chapter number 4, and let's get down to verse number 21. Speaking here, Paul says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had what? Two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. So this covenant that was given at Sinai was a covenant of bondage in the type that is Hagar, that this covenant relationship is not capable of producing children that are free. The covenant relationship of Sinai isn't capable. Why? Because of the weakness of the flesh, Paul tells us in, Ch- in Romans. So we know that because of the weakness of the flesh, that covenant isn't capable of producing spiritual offspring that are free and alive unto God. It only genders unto bondage. And so Paul's going to go on to t- make some correlation here between this covenant and Hagar, and how these things are represented to us in scriptures. And you'll notice he says the the two covenants. So the covenant of the gospel, according to the promise of God, he's already dated back to Abraham, which predates the covenant at Mount Sinai by 430 years. can actually follow the promise of the gospel all the way back to Adam and Eve right after the fall. The covenant God made with the nation of Israel at Sinai came through uh, the giving of the law to Moses. So he's putting these two things in contrast to one another. And he says that this covenant from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, is represented in the scriptures allegorically by Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is. In other words, the Jerusalem of Paul's day, which at that time was controlled by Jews, who were steeped in the law and in tradition, and that was their confidence. We be Abraham's seed, right? But everything was in their mind as carnal. It was all fleshly stuff, even the expectation they had of the Messiah. It says, This speaketh to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage, next three words, with her children. So the children that are born out of the covenant relationship of the law are in bondage. They're not set free. They're in bondage. Why? Because the law only can ever show you that you're a sinner. When you're joined in covenant relationship to God through the law, which speaks of the works of the flesh, the only thing that ever brings is bondage. There's no gospel there. There's no peace. You're only ever bound to live to a law that's only ever going to show you how sinful you are. It does nothing to, to remedy the sin. 
It does nothing to take the sin out of the way. But yet this, this covenant relationship with Hagar that is given at Sinai does have appeal. There's, there's not a shortage of men who enter into covenant relationship with God under this relationship. They enter into relationship with God based on works of the flesh because it appeals to our pride. Just like Abraham and Hagar, when they were trying to work this out, and Sarah says, here's an idea. We want to be able to present our works to God and say, here's the heir, bless it. Here, here's what I've done, bless it. Here's what I'm able to do, bless it. But God says that he has refused all those things. Everything that speaks of man's wisdom, everything that speaks of man's glory, everything that speaks of man's intellect and understanding, everything that could possibly be construed in your heart to speak to your pride, God's refused it. But many there are. And that's why I say you got to be careful when you say Bible believing. What does that mean? All the children of Hagar were Bible believers. But they didn't believe the promise. They didn't believe the gospel. They saw the Bible as a list of things they were bound to to accomplish so that they could take satisfaction in what they did and they would stand before God saying, I kept your commandments. I kept your law. I lived like the Bible said I should live. And I've done it, and I've pulled it off. And they expect to stand before the Lord and to be judged based on that standard. To say, this is what I have been able to do. And they, they really in their hearts believe the Bible. But they believe it teaches them what they have to do. They, they believe it teaches them how to live a good moral life. They believe that it teaches them how to please God by, by cleaning up the flesh in such a way that God will accept him. Well, listen, God's already refused him. Amen. Flesh and blood cannot inherit. Do you hear the scriptures? Flesh and blood cannot inherit. This is all about the inheritance. Because every hope we have lies for us beyond this life. And flesh and blood cannot produce anything. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. You live all your life putting yourself under the burden of the requirements of the law, thinking in your mind that God's happy with that and will bless it. But God has clearly demonstrated from Scripture He's refused all those things. Did He not refuse Cain? When he brought of the work of his hands, of the fruit of the ground, that which he was able to bring forth out of the earth by his own effort, God says, I refuse it. It's not acceptable. It's tainted with the corruption of your own sin from your own heart. Everything you do is tainted by you. And the heart is desperately wicked, and it's so deceitful that you can even come to the word of God the living water itself, and you can come to the Word of God and your heart will find a way for you to read the Scriptures but not believe the Gospel. It will turn it into a system of religion and you will begin to think that if I, if I follow this prescription of do's and don'ts, that God is happy and satisfied with me. And when I stand before Him as one who believed His Word, believed His book, but walked in it in pride that somehow I'm going to stand before him. But the pride itself is sin. The very idea itself that you can become righteous is sin. Because it's not according to the truth. The truth of God's word is that you're a sinner. And you cannot live a life that pleases him. You cannot. That's the gospel. Because then enters Christ who sheds his blood on our account and does for us through his own work what we can never do. The question is, to be a son of Abraham, what relationship are you counting on? Are you in a relationship with God according to the covenant of works? 
Are you in a relationship with God according to the covenant of faith? If you're counting on adding to what Christ has done for God to be pleased with you, we need to rethink our thoughts. No one will be justified in the sight of God by the things he does in the flesh. In Galatians chapter number 4, and we're at verse 21, He's explaining this, and I've kind of lost my place because I was uh, chasing a rabbit there for a minute, perhaps. But nonetheless, these things are important. So these things are an allegory, that, and Hagar tends to bondage, which is where we got. But in verse number 26, he says, Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So what is he saying? He's saying this covenant, the covenant of faith, the faith that Abraham had, that made him the heir of righteousness, that covenant of promise is like Jerusalem which is above. So these two relationships are set against one another as if asking, which mother are you from? Are you you from Hagar that's all about the law of works of the flesh? Or are you in relationship with God through Sarah, which is not of the flesh, but of the spirit? For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of what? But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so is it now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? And in other words, in spite of, the persecution that those who are in the flesh bring upon those who are of promise, what kind of affliction do they bring? According to the flesh. In other words, as long as we walk in the flesh, we can expect, if we're walking in the Spirit, that the Spirit will be uh, criticized and, and run down and basically tormented and persecuted by the flesh, both within ourselves and in the world as those who walk in the spirit of Christ in the world. But this is what we should expect because this is the flesh's domain. This is their kingdom. Nevertheless, the scripture says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. In other words, even those who think, what did they say when Christ showed up? They said, behold, this is the heir. Let's take him and cast him out so that we can lay claim to the inheritance. What is the inheritance? It's the created realm. It's everything that God made and fighting for control of it. This is what's in view, basically, in the scriptures from front to back. And so this this idea that this one of the flesh strives after the flesh to exercise dominion, but ultimately God has already promised what? All of them, the bondwoman and her children, that's what it's saying, children. I was about to say son or children and couldn't decide, so it came out funny. The bondwoman and her son, right? All the bondwoman and her children get what? Cast out. In other words, by the time God brings his promise to come to pass, they have no part in it. They have no part in it. They're completely cast out. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be, next word, verse number 30, heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So what do we have set forth in Scripture? We've got two covenants, two ways by which people seek to be joined to God. The covenant of Sinai, which says, here's a list of things you can do. And the Bible even says, if you can do them, you will live in them. That's scripture. If you you continue in all these things, you'll live in them. So that's one way that men try to come to God. Through that covenant, through that relationship. The other is given to us in Sarah as a type, which is a type of God's promise. And what he's able to do that's completely separate and distinct from anything we can do in the flesh, which is why God waited 
till Abraham was a hundred years old and Sarah was 90. There's no earthly possibility. They can try according to the flesh all they want. There's no earthly possibility that they're going to have an heir. God waits until that time and that season of life and listen, this was their life. Do you realize Abraham and Sarah lived this life? Uh, Sarah was to the age of 90 years old and never had a son, never had a child, so that God could make a point in his word. So you don't ever know what God's doing in your life. You don't know his timing. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. You don't know why God's timing is what it is. Sarah had to live an entire life and probably never understood. But here we are, almost 4,000 4, years after Abraham and Sarah, still talking about their story and looking at what God did in their life as an example. That's what God can do. So she lived this life, and at 90 years old, she conceives and bears a son. Why? So that God could manifest that it's entirely beyond human effort. It's entirely beyond your ability. It's not, it's not anything but faith. They believed the promise of God. And by believing, they became heirs. And God gave them a son, and he became an heir. So the son that's born out of the relationship that tends to promise, which is the covenant of faith, which the, the author of Galatians, Paul here, sets forth as the gospel. And he's contrasting the gospel, which Abraham heard before Christ showed up and preached the gospel the way we think of it. Abraham had gospel, good news, and he had works of the flesh. Abraham had both. There's always been both. The question is, which one are you trusting in? If you're trusting in something that adds to what Christ did, then you're still in bondage. It's not gospel. It's not gospel. I, I have to do something. I have to perform at a certain level. I've got to depend on my resources. I've got to depend on my intellect. I've got to depend on things I can bring to the table in the relationship with Christ. And if I have to trust in anything I'm bringing to that relationship, I'm in bondage. That relationship will never produce life. It will never produce freedom. It will never produce peace. All the things that come with gifts that God gives by the gospel. It's the gospel that brings peace. It's the gospel that gives the gift of righteousness. Not the kind of righteousness you can be by trying to live a good life. That's rejected. That's your Ishmael. That's filthy rags. Look, the Bible says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's the good stuff. That's the things you do trying to do what's right. It's so tainted with our corrupt mind and the infirmities of our flesh and our wicked hearts and the sin that's in our members that it's completely filthy and disgusting. Not even to mention the stuff we do that's actually we know it's sin. That's the good stuff we do. That is our Ishmael, bringing it to God and saying, oh, the Ishmael might live before thee. And God says, he's not the heir. But he tells Abraham something interesting. He said, I've heard you concerning Ishmael. I've heard you. What's Ishmael's name mean? God will hear. God will hear. So here we have these, these two things playing out in time. We have in Abraham's family that which came out of Egypt and was in a relationship that tended to bondage. And we have a son of promise. We have coming out of Israel later. What did God say? He had called his son out of Egypt. So what do we have later? We have the nation of Israel. So first it was a family. And they lived out this whole pattern that's a type. Then we have what? The nation of Israel. And they come out of where? Egypt. They come to Sinai. They enter into a relationship. Many of them we know we're destroyed because of unbelief. We're told that in the New Testament. So they came out to what? Enter into a covenant with God based on their works, their ability to perform. 
their ability to do. Exodus 24, 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord hath said will we do. This is their hope. This is their confidence. And their enjoyment of that covenant with God is based on their ability to be obedient to that covenant. So we have the nation living that out. Well, what do we have now with the gospel of Christ? We have children being brought forth all over the world, not just of a family or a nation, but now globally brought into relationship with God by one of these two mothers. We have Hagar, which is the, the religious laws of things you must observe for God to accept you. You are contributing your works into that relationship, and that's your hope. That's your confidence. Then we have the gospel of Christ, which is a true gospel. It's good news for men, because it's not the kind of bondage that says, if you can live up to it, then God will accept you. It's the kind of gospel that says, God has acknowledged the reality of your condition, knowing that you cannot live up to it. And so thus has provided a way through his own son when he came in the person of Christ in the form of sinful flesh and put that to death on the cross. Both the body of flesh and the law of ordinances that was contrary to us. And that was the enmity between Gentile and Jew. And now we're told there's no difference between them. That we are, can be accepted by God not because what we do, but because only what Christ did. In other words, if your hope of standing before the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, we won't get into all the particulars of that, but either way, you're going to face judgment. Your only hope of hearing anything but depart from me cannot rest in something we did or something we added to it, or something we figured out. There's these two kinds. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 7. Commonly known passage of Scripture. But we will see in this passage exactly what we're talking about. In verse number 13... Christ is imploring those to enter in at the straight gate because there's a wide gate and a broad way that leads to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. But there's a straight gate and a narrow way which leads unto life and few there be that find it. He goes on then to explain that they ought to beware of false prophets. You know, there's an awful lot of teaching in the New Testament about being aware of false teachers and false prophets who come in and they add all kinds of things to the gospel that are not there. He says, you'll know them by their fruits. And he goes on to explain how we can tell a tree. He gets down to verse number 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. A snare of pride. Okay? Okay the snare of pride that it says to the man that reads that in his pride and says, see there, those that do the commandments, they're the ones that make it in, right? They're the ones that make it because they did it. Let me ask you this. Who's boasting in that scenario? God or man? I thought boasting was excluded. You see, it, it tempts our natural mind to read it in pride. And those who walk in pride, he's able to abase, and he also resists the proud. In other words, a proud man cannot read this and know the heart of God. A proud man can't read this and know the mind of God. He can't know the spirit of Christ, because he's thinking about his glory, his satisfaction, his praise, and his worth. And he's thinking, I can do that, and then I'll get the glory, and I'll get the praise, and I'll get all everything that I ought to have coming to me, uh, if I'm able to do the will of the Father, without ever stopping to think, what's the will of the Father? Automatically we're thinking, it's, it's got to be the things I do. But Paul says, 
Those who are in the flesh can't please God. Nothing you can do in the flesh can ever please God. Not according to the natural man. So many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, what do we have that day? That's speaking of the judgment. You may as well put yourself there because you're going to be there. You're going to be here in this picture somewhere. Uh, regardless of everyone's opinion, you don't get to choose whether or not you want to participate in God's plan. You didn't create yourself and put yourself here. You're involved. You're in the plan. You're in this picture. And in this day of judgment that's going to happen, there's going to be many that will say, Lord, Lord. In other words, what are they about to do? They're about to make their case for why they should be able to enter into the kingdom. Notice what their case hinges on. Lord, Lord, have we not? You hear me? What's their confidence? Themselves. The Bible says, out of, your, out of your own words and out of your own mouth, you'll be condemned. And out of your own words and out of your own mouth, you'll be justified. Here, they are condemning themselves in their attempt to justify themselves. You have got to latch a hold of that idea. In your attempt to justify yourself, you condemn yourself. Because you've refused the truth. And here they are thinking they're making a case that's in their favor. Because they're according to the natural mind. They're only thinking about the things they did. God's looking at the heart and says, yeah, you showed up to my judgment with it on your heart to speak about the things you did. That is the condemnation. That is the judgment. That is the sin. That is the pride. That is the guilt. That is the condemnation of man. You showed up to my judgment... And the, the justification you offer is you're going to use this as an opportunity to speak of your own glory and the things you did. You've just condemned yourself by your own heart, through your own attitude, through your own mouth and out of your own words. They will say, have not we prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work, if you're working for your credit and your glory and your pride, you're working iniquity. Those which are born of God seek his glory, his credit, declare his worth. That's why Paul said that he wouldn't boast in anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because it's sin. It ignores the fact of what man really is. He's not that smart. He's not that bright. He's not that rich. He's not that glamorous. He's all the things that we don't want to admit we are. He is desperately wicked. He's poor. He's wretched. He's miserable. He's blind. That's why David the king even confessed, I'm poor and needy. See, the, the spirit knows he's dependent on God. The flesh thinks, I don't need anybody. I got this. I can do it on my own. And God says that those who stand before him, attempting to make an argument that they are worthy, will condemn themselves in their own speaking. We see in 1 John 3.22, says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. I want you to turn there. 1 John. First John 3, 22. Everybody there? Here, a couple pages flipping. In verse number 22, it says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Where does God look? He looks on the heart. He doesn't look on the things of the flesh as men look and judge. So he says we do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should what? Believe, Believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. He that keepeth his commandments 
dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. The son of Isaac, the daughter of Sarai, the free woman, not the son of bondage, Hagar, the Egyptian, who was a bondwoman, and her offspring are also bound under the curse of the law. So we see represented in these two very clearly, as well as in the teachings of Christ. And I want you to turn to Luke chapter number 18. This came up the other day. Um, Curtis and I were talking, and, and we looked at this passage, and, it, and it's the exact same idea. In Luke chapter number 18, verse number 10, what you're about to see is you're going to get the opportunity to view the world not through the eyes of man, but through the eyes of Christ. So if you're viewing the world through the eyes of Christ, notice how this, how this looks. Two men went up into the temple to pray. Okay? So what do we have? This is a tale of two sons. We got a story of two sons right here in this, in this, in this passage. They're both going up to pray, to talk to their father, and they're both in a relationship with him under one of the covenants, either the covenant of Sinai under Hagar or the covenant of the gospel under Isaac. It says these two men went up to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican, okay? What were those? Those are labels that men came up with to decide who's what. You need to understand that. Those are labels that people put on them to say, oh, this is who they are. Now, if you're looking at this story not through the eyes of Christ, but through the eyes of the men of this time, before the story even continues, you already know one of these men is doing pretty well. He's got his act together, and he's, he's doing right. He's, uh, he's doing what he ought to be doing. You know, he's, he's living a cleaned up life. He's a cleaned up guy, and he's got his act together. He lives by the Bible, and he's uh, doing everything that you would expect a good, upstanding citizen of the community to be doing. Right? So that would be the Pharisee. And then this other guy, the publican. Well, everybody knows publicans, right? Tax collectors, they're greedy, they're selfish, they rob, cheat, and steal. And uh, nobody likes those guys. So we, let's just label them because it's easier. You know, it's easier if you just label somebody. You don't have to really get to know them. Um, a lot of people do that. You just put a label on somebody. Oh, he's whatever. And then once you label them, it's really just an intellectual lazy card that we play to get out of having to get to know them and really have a, a true relationship with somebody that might require some effort on our part. So if I just label them, I can stick a label on them and say they're one of those, and then I don't have to get to know them, and it excuses me which you'll find that the, the carnal mind is good at excusing ourselves. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus, next two words. Okay? So he's praying with himself. I'm concerned that many Christians today are praying with themselves. It's not that they're not seeking the blessings of God and that they don't have a relationship with him through his word. It's just he's not in a relationship with them because they're coming to him presenting their Ishmael and saying receive him and God saying I'm not going to receive that I'm not going to have your Ishmael there's too much glory in it for you if I do so the Pharisees praying with himself God I thank thee that I am not as other men are so what do we notice about the covenant of Sinai this is the kind of children it produces Men who look at the world and see it through the lens of degrees of who's righteous based on what they do in the flesh. It's a completely carnal way of approaching life. And, he, and he's looking at the world and he's saying, boy, I sure have come a long way. I mean, I'm pretty glad I'm not like these other guys. They haven't kept near as many of the commandments as I have. But the Bible does say if you've broken one, you're guilty of the whole thing. So you are now under the curse. This man doesn't know that. He's blinded to his own condition because of his pride. 
He's looking only at the commandments he has kept. And he's happy with himself, and that's his confidence. God will be pleased with me because I've kept these commandments. But if you're guilty, you're guilty in the, in the eyes of God. The Bible says there's no difference. So he prayed with himself, I'm thankful that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I hope he wasn't praying out loud, but you never know. I wouldn't pass, put it past him. And the, the publican's right there with him praying, and he's like, I'm, I'm really glad I'm not him, Lord. Because uh, that's, I wouldn't want to be him. He's all the things I just said I'm glad I'm not. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, if you just heard that prayer, and you're uh, looking through the eyes of Christ, you know what you hear? I, 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 I. That's what you hear. It's nothing but using prayer as an opportunity to come to God to show all the things that I've done and expect that God's going to just reciprocate with blessings. It's a very pagan idea of who God is. I'll continue to say that. If your idea of God is that he's going to bless you only based on how you perform, it's a very pagan idea of who God is. He's, he's in a relationship with his children. If you're one of his children, then his love for you is unfailing and it's constant and it's sure. And he's going to teach you some things and he's going to grow you up and he's going to work in your life to, to draw you to himself and to make you more useful to him and to give you more of the gifts that he gives, such as peace and joy, happiness, contentment. The world could use a little contentment these days. Not a lot of people that are content with their lot in life. But I have to ask you, who gave you that lot? Who gave it to you? You don't, you don't like where you're at in life? You don't like your job? You don't like your family? You don't like your parents? You don't like your kids? You don't like your spouse? You don't like your home? You don't like your church? I mean, there's always something to gripe about, right? I don't have what he has, and I wish I had something different than I've got. And grumbling, complaining. Sounds like Ishmael to me. Sounds like Ishmael. We should be content if we have the Spirit of God. So here's this guy. In juxtaposition to him, which means two things said in contrast to one another, we have what? This publican, right? A lousy, a lousy Republican. A lousy publican. He's probably no better than a Republican. Here we have a publican. Where's he standing? Why? He's ashamed. I've got more hope for a man who feels a sense of shame and worthlessness in his life than a man who thinks he's got it figured out. More hope for that man. He wouldn't even lift up his eyes unto heaven. Why? He's not worthy. He knows what he is. He said, but he smote his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now listen to me. We're looking through the eyes of Christ. Because if we hadn't had the next verse, we would probably not understand this. We see two men. One has his life. It's all figured out. He knows what he's doing and why. He's got all the answers. Uh, you know, he's spoken of a lot in Romans chapter number 2. He's confident that he himself is a guide to the blind and a light unto the world and a teacher of things that are good and an instructor of babes. He's that guy. He knows it all. He's got it all figured out. Uh, and if anybody wants to know how you ought to be living your life, go talk to that guy because he can tell you what you ought to be doing. He's got it all figured out. He knows everything about everything, and he's, he's got no questions at all, uh, very confident of himself. Then we have this publican who wouldn't even look to heaven and he's simply pleading for God's mercy. Notice what Christ says. I tell you, this man went down to his house. Next word. Justified. justified. Somebody tell me what the word justified means. Rendered righteous or made such as he ought to be. You know, when God looks at a man, we have an idea of what 
of what a good Christian ought to look like, what a good Christian ought to be. The Bible says from the words of Christ that this second man was the one who was as he ought to be. It's totally foreign and backwards to how we think. In other words, this sec what do we have here? We have a tale of two sons. We've got two men, both in relationship with God, one deceiving his own heart, thinking I can have a relationship with God on the basis of works of the flesh, which is Paul's whole argument in the book of Galatians. You can't. If you're going to have a relationship with God, it must be through Christ. And through Christ is by faith. So the question for us this morning is, are we in Isaac or are we in Ishmael? Bible believer doesn't quite go far enough. A lot of people are Bible believers. But who are you trusting? Are you trusting the promise of God? Or are you still trusting in your works, your wisdom, your intellect? The only hope you can have, and this is where you have to, where you have to be, when you stand before Christ in the judgment, what answer can you give? You have to know. It has to be in your heart to know what the answer you can give is. You have to have already given an answer and pled to him the answer before you meet him. But if it's anything around I, that's very dangerous. If it's anything around because you, you're in a very safe place. If you say because you left me a promise that even though I'm a sinner and I'm not worthy of forgiveness, that you've promised to those who believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for me because he wanted to forgive me. That implies he knows what I am. He knows how wicked I am. He knows my heart is not right. He knows I'm doing the wrong stuff all the time. But he wanted to forgive me. And if I would just believe, you promised that those who believe would receive the gift of righteousness, the gift of eternal life, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of hope, the gift of joy, all the good gifts that he gives are promised to those who believe, not those who do. Doing the works of God speaks of the works of the heart, not the works of the flesh. We're so carnal, so carnal, that when the Bible says that we ought to do his commandments, the first thing we think of is what? Carnal. It's the stuff in the flesh. Doing a work in our spirit means to do. What are you doing? It's an act of following, putting your faith in Christ, trusting in only what he did and what he says. There's no me in it. There's not room. There's not room for me in the gospel. I'm a recipient of grace, a recipient of his blessing. So when we come to the throne of Christ and we plead, well, I came forward, what are we trusting in? myself well I said the prayer what are you, what's, your, what's your hope it's what you did I repeated after the guy and he told me the prayer and I prayed, it, I prayed the prayer that's not what's required there's not, there's not a work of the flesh that you can put confidence in it doesn't start with because I well I changed uh, I repented and I don't do the same old stuff I used to do That's not an answer. That's an Ishmael. It's really important that you wrap your mind around this. What God is looking for is a humble and contrite man that trembles at his word. We see that right here in verse number 13. A humble and contrite man who trembled at the word of God. God says that's the man that he's going to have respect to. So if you had to decide between these two men, you say, I want my life to be a living picture of a man that is as he ought to be, 
I'm afraid in many churches it's the first guy. But Christ says, for a man that looks like he is as he ought to be, we'll find that example in the second guy. Humble, contrite, trembling at the word of God, and understanding that it's of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our only hope. It's our only hope. Being a Bible believer, according to works, isn't going to get you there. It's all of faith. It's all of faith. And I think we'll, uh, I thought I might get through that this morning. We got close. Maybe we'll just button up a few ideas this evening. I apologize for being a little long this morning. Um, you know, we live in a time when there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of stuff out there, to quote a good friend of mine. Uh, there is just a lot of stuff out there. All of that that adds to the gospel of Christ if it puts some glory in it for men, be wary of it. Amen. Be wary of it. Amen. The truth is, is right here. It's right here. And for those who believe in what Christ did, not sprinkling in other stuff, feeling like that second guy, wishing you could do better. Don't we all? <laughs> Don't we all? Don't you think Abraham did too? Guess what it turns out Abraham had? He had a flesh. That's what made that whole mess to begin with. But God had purpose in it and uses it for our instruction. Amen? Let's all stand and be dismissed with a verse of invitation.